Good evening, everyone, and welcome to yet another webinar from European Students for Liberty. I'm Nick Roskams. I'm the webinar director for ESFL. And just before we start, allow me to say a few words about European Students for Liberty. We are a non-profit organization run by students for students. We try to empower the student movement in Europe by providing all sorts of resources, by providing networking opportunities and events to uh, allow people, young students, to learn about the ideas of classical liberalism all around Europe and to start up new groups and to allow people to become leaders for liberty as students and in their later life as alumni. Um, many of you will probably have already heard about our regional conferences that have just ended last weekend. They were a big success. I hope some of you have uh, had the opportunity to attend them. And our next conference will be in March next year. I'll talk a little bit more about that in uh, when, our, when this webinar is over. Tonight, we are joined by Dr. Pauline Dixon, who is a senior lecturer in education and development at Newcastle University, England. And she, has a, uh, she is a, an expert in the field that we're going to talk about tonight because she gained her PhD on the subject Regulation of Private Schools for the Poor in India, an Austrian Economic Perspective. And she will be talking about how private schools are serving the poorest. Um, so I'm, I trust that we'll have a very interesting talk from her. During the webinar, you will have the, the opportunity to post your questions under the question tab that you can see in your control panel, and those we will be able to read out uh, to uh, Pauline when her talk is over. So feel free to post any and all questions there. So without m uh, much further ado, I give you Pauline Dixon. Thank you very much, Nick, and I do hope that everybody can hear me. It's very odd sitting in my office at work talking to my screen, and I just hope that none of my colleagues are looking through the window because I think they will think that I have I eventually um, cracked under the strain. Anyway, Nick, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction, and welcome, everybody, and thank you so much for tuning in tonight. As Nick said, I'd like to talk about uh, private schools for the poor around the world, and I'd like to start off hopefully with a video it's only of China and India though but I must warn you um, there's going to be some music coming up next so if you do have your headphones uh, very tightly in your ears you might just want to remove them just a little bit because the music might be uh, loud so I hope you enjoy this next video which we can't see <laughs> Where you been? Where you been all my life? This is sin. The way you look in my life. It's obvious that I want something from you. You know what? What I want to do. It would bring me to life. I can only imagine, only imagine what you find. Oh, every time it would bring me to life. I can only imagine, only imagine what it be like. What it be like. So they are some of the uh, pictures and videos that I've taken over the last 12 years that I've been researching into low-cost private schools in the developing world. This picture that you can see here I took in Hyderabad in India some years ago and some of you may have seen my TED talk where I explain that it's one of the best photographs I believe 
uh, that I've taken because it engenders everything I believe about entrepreneurship, about slum areas, people not waiting around for governments to actually do something for them. They don't wait around for governments to do anything because they're typically not going to do anything. And you can see this is a marketplace in it, the vibrant, and the colours within the photograph are, are, are just engendering everything everything that's going on in a place like a low-income area like this in Hyderabad. But some of you may notice, sorry about that, some of you may notice in the top left-hand corner there is an advertisement. And I didn't know this at the time, it's an advertisement for a low-cost private school, Galaxy School, which is advertised there. It says it's government recognized and it's in one of these English medium schools here in Hyderabad. So, so one of my favorite photographs that I've taken over the years. I'm going to talk to you about the Sir John Templeton Foundation research that we did here at the E.G. West Centre. I, I work with Professor James Tooley and Professor Sagata Mitra, some of you may have heard of them. And in 2003, we had a Temp Sir John Templeton Foundation grant for about a million dollars. And we worked in the following countries, Ghana, Nigeria, Kenya, India and China. And we wanted to explore uh, the types of education that existed within slum and low income areas in these countries. Currently, we've actually got another John Templeton grant and we're looking at schooling in post-conflict zones. So the new countries that we're actually looking at are Sierra Leone, South Sudan and Liberia. But today I'm just going to talk about these countries. So what did we actually want to do? The accepted wisdom, as some of you probably realize, is that private schools serve the elite, serve the privileged, and everyone else, especially the poor, require public education or government schools. So it is often assumed, or it has been assumed, that private schools are for the elite and not for the poor. But we wanted to challenge this in this uh, brown, groundbreaking research. And we were looking at three assumptions, really, three hypotheses. And the first one is that private education for the poor does not exist. Because in 2003, 2004, it was generally assumed that it didn't. Also, that free government schools or free public education is the only way to increase enrollment for the poor. So the poor actually would need more government schools, not private schools. And the other assumption was that where private education or private schools for the poor did exist, then it was of lower quality than the government schools. So there we were uh, wandering around slum areas. At first it was a bit disparaging because we would arrive somewhere like this. This is Kibera slum in Kenya. And we were working with James Shikwati there in Kenya. And when we arrived at uh, Kenya uh, in the airport there, he said, well, I don't know why you've come to Kenya because there are no low cost private schools here. But that's what we wanted to find out. And if that was a finding of our research, then so be it. And so at first, when we went to these areas, people would say, I'm sorry, I don't know why you've come here. There aren't any low-cost private schools. Well, in fact, they were wrong. What we had to do was go into these slums and we had to walk around all the areas and first of all, see if private schools existed, what did they look like, and then also who did they cater for. At the time, there was no GPS, so we had to draw our own maps. As you can see, there's one here, and at the time, maps of slum areas and low income areas didn't exist. So our researchers and we all got together and we drew these maps and ourselves and the researchers walked down every alleyway and around every street corner. And when we came upon a school, a government school or a private school or a school run by an NGO or church school, we actually put a dot on the map. And you can see there are dots there. There are different color maps dots for different uh, school types and so we would know that we had covered that alleyway and that we had been to those schools. Once we found a school then we arranged for a survey and a census to take place in each of those schools and what we found was actually quite amazing. We've got the data here from two of the India studies. Now if we look at the Hyderabad study we found in total in three zones of Hyderabad. So Hyderabad is the old city there in Andhra Pradesh. And we're talking about just three zones, which is about 19 square miles. 
And in those 19 square miles, we found a total of 918 schools, which is a huge amount of schools. Interestingly, we found that 36% of those were what's called private unrecognized schools, and 23% were private recognized. Now, these unrecognized schools are schools that do not abide by the uh, on paper laws and rules. So, as of yet, they have not gained an official stamp if you like, from the state or from the government or from the district education officer. So what's really interesting is many, many of these low-cost, private, unrecognized schools at the time were not on anybody's radar, so they were not on official lists. So we found in those three zones of Hyderabad, 335 of these schools that weren't on the official government list. And 36% of these schools, of the 918, were these unrecognized schools. So in total, if we add up the unrecognized and recognized schools, 30, 40, 50, 70, 58, 59, 60% of uh, schools in the, this low income area, these three zones, were private, unrecognized, and recognized schools. Only a third of the schools were government. And then again, we look to the next figures, and this is Delhi. This is in North Shahadra and East Delhi. And we looked at only at the notified slum areas within North Shahadra. And again, this is about 20 square miles. And you can see again, there are these 73, there are 73 private unrecognized schools and 102 recognized. So again, in total, about 60% of the schools there are these low cost, 66% of the schools are low cost private schools. And nobody had these 73 schools on a list and nobody had these 335 schools on a list. But you might be saying, well, yes, these schools might be very small and compared to a government school and so on. Well, actually, if we look at the number of children attending these schools in total, there's about a quarter of a million children attending those uh, 900 odd schools. But if we see 65% of the children are going to these private, low cost private schools, and I'll tell you what I mean by low cost in a minute. But amazingly, a quarter of the children, a quarter of the children are going to these unrecognized schools. 60,000 kids are going to low cost, unrecognized private schools that do not or did not appear on anyone's radar. Similar findings in Africa. We did the research in Ga, in Ghana, where there's about half a million inhabitants, 70% of which live on or below the poverty line. Again, 75% of schools that we found were these private schools, private registered and unregistered schools. In the three districts of Lagos State, uh, again, uh, two were urban and one was rural, we found 540 schools, 66% of these schools are private. You might say, well, are they uh, run by churches or charities? Actually, in Ghana, no uh, school, that the private school said they were run by a religious group and just a very small number said charitable trust. All the other ones were run by individual proprietors. That's individual proprietors who are actually uh, running their school uh, in search of a profit. So these schools are looking to make a profit. And again, you can see 65% of people enrollment in Ghana, in, Ga in the district of Ga, were in private schools, and 75% of the schools that we found, 75% of the children there, were going to low-cost private schools. So the research that we did walking around the slum areas in all of the districts that we went to, in the countries we went to, private education for the poor was forming a majority of provision for poor families. And what we found was that because of these unrecognized, unregistered schools, the official figures with education departments and so on drastically underestimated the enrollment of children in primary and secondary schools. We're talking about, typically in India, these schools are what's called all through schools. So they go from nursery all the way up to class 10, which is about 16 year old or so. But this is a really, really good news story because it means that education for all will be much easier to achieve because more children are attending schools than the official figures actually show. So that was our first assumption that we looked at, that private schools don't just serve the elite, they actually serve the poorest or the poor as well. So the second assumption that we looked at at the beginning was that, well, the poor need free 
government schools or free public schools, and that's the only way to increase enrollment for the poor. Well, how did we investigate that? Well, in 2003, Kenya introduced free primary education. The World Bank gave $55 million, one of the largest grants they've ever given, uh, to allow Kenya to achieve this so that children could attend school for free for free primary education. Bill Clinton said this is the best thing that's ever happened and the person he would most like to meet was the President of Kenya because he'd made such a difference to children's lives. Well, little did uh, President Clinton know how much a difference the President of Kenya actually made. We did the survey and census again in the slum of Kibera, which is about the size, sorry about this, which is about the size of um, Central Park. And we initially in 2003 found 76 low cost private schools and secondary schools. And there were about 12,000 kids enrolled in those schools. We actually did a longitudinal study, and again in 2008, we covered the same area. And this time, we actually found 116 private schools, enrolling about 27 or 28,000 students. So even though free primary education had been introduced in 2003, one might have thought there would be a crowding out of these low-cost private schools. Well, in fact, there are now, or in 2008, and I'm, I'm sure if we did the research again, another longitudinal study uh, part, then we would find there were more of these low-cost private schools and more children going to them. Okay, so what happened? Why is it that the government thought this was a quick win? Well, if we look at Kibera, on the top of Kibera, there are five government schools surrounding Kibera, and we have these low-cost private schools in the dip in Kibera. We asked the government and the private schools how many children had left and how many children had come to their schools because of free primary education. In the government schools, we noted that the increase in enrollment in the government schools was about 3,296 kids. And it was heralded as a great success that free primary education was making such a difference so that children from the slum areas could now go to school. And if you read UNESCO documents and so on, it says that across the country, across Kenya, millions of more children are going to school because of free primary education. Well, that's not what we found uh, was the reality. In fact, when we did our research, we asked the private schools how much they had declined in enrollment since free primary education in 2003. And they told us when we added it all up, it was about 6,000 kids had left the low cost private schools in 2003. We also investigated how many low cost private schools had closed down because of the introduction of free primary education. And we estimated that 4,600 children had lost their places in these schools that had then closed down. So if we consider those numbers and then add in those, the increase in enrollment in those five government schools up at the top of Kibera, we're actually 7,875 kids short, which would imply to us that the introduction of free primary education actually had a negative effect and that children lost their school places because they were already going to school. This is the point. Children in Kibera already had their own schools that they were going to. As soon as free primary education came about, then this caused actually problems for the low-cost private schools in Kibera. And more children were out of school than in school after the introduction of free primary education. But as our research shows in 2008, the uh, private sector in Kibera, and this is uh, one of the schools in Kibera there, is actually burgeoning. And so we have to ask ourselves, why was there no crowding out? Why is it that private schools still exist, even when there has been the introduction of free primary education? Well, one uh, school owner said, when the government initiated free primary education, few children ran away. And after six months, they started coming back again after realizing that the standard of education in the government is very low due to the high rate of enrollment, lack of teachers, congestion, and lack of sitting and learning materials. Now my school is full again. Another one said, I allow the following flexible admission criteria. Age is not a determining factor. Uniform is not a rule for admission. Parents participate in major issues at the school. We have a child friendly approach. There's extra coaching for slow learners at free cost. We carry out home visits following up children in the community. 
And finally, one a school owner said the introduction of free primary education offered the enrollment of students in the school whereby many students ran to free government schools, after which they realised that teaching in free school was not all that good, they came back. So what the low-cost private school owners were saying is that they were offering better value for money. It's, it's a, a wrong belief, if you like, to believe that government schools are actually free because there are a lot of hidden costs. So even when we're looking at free primary education in government schools, it's actually not free. Children need to pay for textbooks, they need to pay for uniforms, whereas in the low-cost private schools, they may not need a uniform, they can come to school without shoes on and so on, whereas there are lots of rules and regulations that the poor parents would have to follow in a government school. So, parents and children disagree with the government, that government schools are the best way forward, and this was shown to us, especially in Kibera, where once free primary education had been introduced, once the parents believed that the school, the government schools, weren't catering for their needs as the low-cost private schools had done, they actually returned back to their own private schools. And this is a picture here of one of the private schools here on a very muddy day, as you can see, in Kibera. But perhaps it's a good thing, some people would say, especially people from Oxfam or UNESCO, that poor children transfer from these mushrooming private schools, as they call them, to be a bit disparaging about them, to government schools. Actually, if you look at the Education for All Global Monitoring Report of 2009, it is very disparaging about low-cost private schools, although it has little data upon which to base this. It says, the rapid emergence of low fee private schools raises a different set of concerns and notice the word concerns. To what extent have they raised standards and enhanced equity? There is little cause for optimism. That's, that's very telling, there is little cause for optimism. Secondly, for the poorest groups, public investment and provision constitutes the only viable route to an education that meets basic quality standards. One has to ask upon which uh, research are they, and evidence are they basing that? And then finally, in the Education for All Global Monitoring Report, it says, low fee private schools are a symptom of failure in public provision, not a solution to the problem. Again, one has to ask why they believe it, they are not a solution. The lesson, transferring responsibilities to communities, parents and private providers is not a substitute for fixing public sector education systems. And notice that they want to fix public sector education systems, even though they've been trying to fix them for many, many years, they still believe that this is the only way forward. In fact, what is this assumption about low quality private schools? Why, why is it that it's often bandied around that uh, people from UNESCO or Oxfam or people like Mary, and you can see the video from the Newsnight video, which is on, on YouTube, and maybe I can send the, the link to Nick later on. Um, you can see that this education administer actually calls parents who send their children to low-cost private schools in Nigeria, uh, in Makoko, she calls them ignoramuses. She says they are ignoramuses because they don't know that government schools are free. She also says that private schools are the good, the bad, and the very ugly, these are her words, even though she hadn't been to see a private school or she hadn't been to Makoko before the Newsnight video. Also, she says that low-cost private schools are ill-equipped, unapprovable private schools, and they are causing a lot of damage, generations wasted, and she actually said that children come out half Bait. So again, it's quite damaging that somebody like Mary actually says this without any evidence. So what we did in our research was look at the quality of low-cost private schools compared to government schools. And we did this in three ways. First of all, we talked to parents, then we did a survey of inputs, and then we did a survey of achievement. And what we found when we talked to parents, parents believed that if they sent their children to a low-cost private school, they actually got a better service and a better quality. They believed that not only because of what they saw when they visited the classrooms and when they saw the children's homework, but they also believed that if they pay for something, then the teachers and the school owner are accountable to them. And they believed that it would mean that they could go and complain or they could go and investigate if something was going wrong. If their child came back and said they actually weren't doing something on that day, then the parent could actually go to the school and find out what was going on. 
they believed that this was not the case in a free government school. First of all, the teachers don't really come from the communities themselves in the government schools. They're just transferred from different areas and they don't actually know about the communities themselves. Whereas teachers and school owners are typically from those communities. These schools are organic and they've grown up organically within their own communities and so they know the people they know the parents they know the children they speak the same tongues they, they speak the same languages um, and the same accents whereas the teachers and the head teachers in the government schools are often quite alienated from those communities so parents felt that paying those fees actually gave them accountability and it gave them control over their uh, children's education one um, parent said, if you are offered free fruit and vegetables at the market, you know they will be rotten. If you want fresh produce, produce, then you will have to pay for it. So he believed that if you were offered something for free, then it was very suspect. But if you paid for it, then you knew it would be fresh and you would be getting value for money. So obviously, parents believe that uh, low-cost private schools are of better quality. If we look at a survey of inputs, for example, then pupil-teacher ratios in low-cost private schools are much smaller. It is much more likely that your teacher in a low-cost private school, whether it's recognised or unrecognised, is actually in the classroom and teaching. Government schools have huge problems with teacher absenteeism. So low-cost private schools, the inputs were better, and also teacher activity and uh, teacher attendance is much better. If we look at this table here, we can look at, for example, drinking water, toilets, separate toilets for boys and girls. And this is in this is again in Hyderabad. And you can see here, if we look at the private schools, it's much more likely that these schools have the item or the input available compared to the government school. If you see here, we've got the low-cost private schools, even the unrecognized schools, 96% of them had drinking water for children. Uh, only around half of the government schools had drinking water for children in, in, in those three zones of Hyderabad. Again, toilets for, for boys and girls. The majority of low-cost private schools, that's private unaided schools, that's what the PUA stands for, again, the majority of them had toilets available. Again, only half of the government schools have functioning toilets for, for boys and girls. So again, those inputs, if we compare low-cost private schools to government schools serving the same communities, private schools have better equipment and better inputs. But that wasn't the end of the story. What we then did, we tested around 24,000 children around the world. And we tested them typically in mother tongue, English, maths. We tested IQ in order to control for um, uh, innate ability. And then we also gave background questionnaires in order to control for family background. And we tested 24,000 children, about 4,000 children in each location. And this is actually raw scores, but you can see, and, and we've controlled for everything, and I'll, I'll show you the papers later, but this is maths in Ghana, this is English in Ghana, and this is religious and moral education. And this is the average raw score here for the students attending, this is the government school, this is the unrecognized school or unregistered, and this is the registered. And you can see you've got this shape continuously where the registered school outperforms the unregistered school, and um, which outperforms the government schools. So what we were finding in each place, we had the same sort of graphs. It was that the private schools were outperforming the government schools. And this is the one for India. You can see this is the average raw score for a government school child. This is the average raw score uh, for the private unrecognized and then recognized. And you can see the shape of the graph. It didn't matter which subject it was. Um, in fact, the low cost private schools were out, children in low cost private schools were outperforming those in government schools. As I say, they were the raw scores, but if you want to read our papers, we've got uh, one paper, a journal article in the School Effectiveness Journal, 
and another one in the Journal of School Choice. And we've used multi-level modeling in one of the papers, and we've also used uh, the Heckman-Lee two-step procedure, which is a, a, an econ econometric type procedure, in order to control for family background and so on. And still, the low-cost private school children uh, come out significantly better in the subjects that we tested in. Boys and girls are going to low-cost private schools as well. It's, it depends on which country you're in, um, but that girls also go to low-cost private schools. So it's a fallacy to say that only boys go to low-cost private schools. So you might be thinking, well, if she keeps going on about low-cost private schools, what does she actually mean? Well, these uh, school fees are affordable. And for example, in India, to send one child to a low-cost private school would cost about 6% of minimum wage, if you like. So 6% of an auto rickshaw driver's wages would send a child to a low-cost private school. It's a little bit more expensive in Africa. It's about 9 or 10%. So we found that the majority of poor school children are going to low-cost private schools and private school education, private schools are outperforming the government ones and this is at a fraction of the teacher costs and it's sort of because teachers in low-cost private schools actually earn about a quarter of the salaries of those in government schools and that's because government school teachers are generally um, better qualified, they'll have a trained teacher certificate probably, whereas in, in the low-cost private schools, typically the teachers would be somebody going to university, somebody that's just got their degree, but is passionate about transferring their knowledge to the children and very passionate, but they actually probably would not qualify as a government school teacher, where actually being a qualified government school teacher doesn't mean that you're a better teacher, and it doesn't actually mean that you are um, any more committed uh, than the, those in the low-cost private schools. I'll just quickly skip over China. <laughs> Sorry if there's anyone from China there. Um, because we actually did do some research in China, in Beijing and Gansu province. And for those of you who have read James Tooley's The Beautiful Tree, you will know that when we went to China, uh, we tried to do the research, and the local education officers actually said that um, when James Tooley said, well, we want to do some research on low-cost private schools in Gansu province. He'd actually found 10 or so low-cost private schools already. The official said to him, ah, James, what you are describing is logically impossible. Uh, we, have a we have schooling for both the rich and the poor here in China. So low-cost private schools for the poor is logically impossible. However, we did manage to do the research and we found many, many schools in Gansu province. I think it was about 578, where the official number said about 44. But also in Beijing, there are low-cost private schools for what's called the floating population. And the floating population are children from workers from rural areas who don't have urban passports, um, so they can't access government schools in urban areas. It's very difficult for them to do so. So entrepreneurs have set up these low-cost private schools in places like Beijing and Shanghai in order to cater, in order to uh, provide education for these children from rural areas. But also in Gansu province, it's often the case that girls attend these low-cost private schools because it's too far for them to walk maybe two or three hours to the local government schools down uh, in the mountains and in the hills. And in fact, we also found low-cost private schools operating in caves. I hope you're all still with me. <laughs> I hope you're still there. It's very tricky not knowing if you're still there or not. I may be talking to myself, but here we go. Um, this is Makoko, a shanty town on stilts, home to some 50,000 people. This is in Nigeria. And I just wanted to use this as an example because you may be saying, well, people who are on a wage can actually send their children to low-cost private schools. But what about the poorest? How can they access low-cost private schools? Well, this is uh, Kenadi Private School. Uh, when we went to Nigeria, the children um, told us that they went to Kennedy Private School. I actually thought they meant President Kennedy, and it wasn't until a school named after President Kennedy. And it wasn't until we got to the school, we actually saw it was Kenadi Private School, but the kids are just so, so, so sweet. This is BSE uh, down the bottom here, the school owner, and he opened the school in 1989, and I think he started it on his mum's veranda or under a tree when he noticed that children in his community weren't being educated. 
But what typically happens is that these school entrepreneurs will provide scholarships or concessionary places for the poorest. So, for example, in Makoko here we have some numbers, a total num number of about <clears throat> 1,640 students. 121 are uh, provided schooling free uh, by the school owner and by the schools, and 25 have these concessionary places. That would be if you had, say, three children, the first child would pay full fee, the second child would maybe pay half fee, and then the third child maybe would go to the school um, for free. 9% don't pay or they actually get these concessionary fees. So there's this, these scholarships and concessionary fees that the school owners actually initiate themselves in order for some of the poorest children to be able to access low-cost private schools. And here we see this is Andrew Mitchell, who used to be the permanent secretary for international development here in the UK with BSE. But this is now taking the story a little bit further because international aid agencies have now become interested in the low-cost private schools market and they actually are trying to do something to help. And we must have a warning here and we'll talk about the warning in the next five minutes or so. So I'll just talk for another five or ten minutes. But this is Andrew Mitchell meeting BSE that you just saw a picture of at Ken Adi Private School. Um, so what could be the way forward then? So we've, we've got all this information now. Uh, it's generally agreed that low-cost private schools now exist. It's still probably not agreed about the quality. And to be honest, quality can, could be improved. But what are the ways for making markets work for the poor? How, how can one help these low-cost private schools get better? Because there are people helping the government schools and they've had money thrown at them over the years and there's been issues and problems. So that's one side of the coin, but the other side of the coin is actually trying to help these low-cost private schools. Well, here we have a, a list of um, issues or items that we could discuss. For example, scholarships and vouchers. So building upon the philanthropy that those low-cost private school owners are already giving to the poor. So we could initiate scholarships and vouchers. Investments, so for example, looking at chains of private schools. There's obviously the Amiga chain in Ghana that now has about 30 schools in its chain. There's also the bridge chain of, of private schools, low-cost private schools in Kenya. So making investments in those and doing research around those. Loan schemes. In India, it is illegal for private schools to make a profit. There's this unique Krishnan decision and other decisions afterwards that say that it is illegal for school owners to make a profit. So it's very difficult for them to actually um, get loans. So it's actually helping these low-cost private school owners get microfinance because they can't actually show their true profit levels and their profit margins. Innovation, we're going to have a quick look at pedagogy to help uh, go and move away maybe from the rote learning and, and make learning much more fun and much more creative with thinking skills and so on for the children in these low-cost private schools. Help federations of low-cost private schools um, build their capacity and also do some training and development. I work with ARC, Absolute Return for Kids, and they're actually doing a voucher scheme. We're actually doing a voucher scheme there in Shahadra. About 835 kids are going to school. It costs about £100 altogether. We're doing a randomised controlled trial comparing about 900 kids who've got a voucher to 900 kids that didn't get a voucher to see what effects vouchers have on children's ability and children's learning. This is here you can see the vouchers. Um, uh, and they're for different things, so it's about £100 a year. This is the book voucher here, and um, this is the uniform voucher, as you can see, with the child with the uniform on. And there's a barcode here, a unique barcode per child, which tries to minimise on corruption. So the parents get the voucher, they present the voucher to the school owner, who then redeems it in order to get his fee. And we've had one year of results, and so far we're seeing that there's been a significant effect on maths, there's been no effect on Hindi or English at the moment, but considering the children had only been in school for about three or four months, they were tested before they got the voucher and they were tested when they'd been in school for about three or four months, then that's, that's not bad going. Chains of low-cost private schools, I've already mentioned, bridge schools, new globe schools, Amiga schools and so on. The finance, 
As I said, in India, money goes under the bed, it's difficult to access loans, so helping these low-cost private schools get some microfinance, so the idea of the Grameen Bank and Mohammed Yunus again uh, raises its head there. Regulations, there's lots of corruption and bribery goes on, so we actually need uh, outside people to maybe evaluate these schools so that the parents have got something to go on, because if recognition uh, actually means very little and it's very difficult for the parents to actually evaluate uh, how good the schools are. So a, a good evaluation method would um, really suffice. And there I'm talking at with uh, my dear friend uh, Fazalira Kurum who is a who runs a federation in Hyderabad there um, and it's trying to strengthen them and, and give them a little bit more strength I, I guess and and also help them with their curriculum. Um, Pedagogy and learning. We're just going to see a brief film. So again, mind your head, mind your ears. This is a typical lesson in India on um, learning that they, these children have to learn. They also have to do it for homework. They've been doing this lesson for about 45 minutes. So you'll see how learning is done in a classroom, a private school in India. <laughs> I think you get the general idea. So from where do we get all? We get all from sheep, sheep is spelling. And this is because of the exam system though, because they will get that question in the exam, from where do we get wool? We get wool from blank, and they have to fill that in. Problem is, when you say to the children, what is a sheep, they have no idea what you're talking about. So it's just this back and forward, rote learning, day in, day out. And that's basically not only for English, but for every other subject as well. So there's this great, uh, again, a great pedagogy and learning exercise that I've been doing with ARC using a, a system called Jolly Phonics and Genki English. And you'll see this next lesson, you can see it's much more fun. You can see the teacher being engaged here with the kids. The kids are actually coming out to play games. They're actually looking like they're enjoying the lesson. There's lots of dancing there and songs going on. Very different from that rote learning lesson we've just seen. And then we'll see a quick, and I'll, I'll I'll end it quite quickly, uh, some children doing what's called partner work, which they would never have done uh, in India prior to having uh, these sessions. So here we go again. <laughs> And there you see the children doing the sounds of the letters, but they're working on their own, they're working in partners and they're working together, which is a huge improvement on the road learning. Uh, we're running out of time, so I was going to show you this little boy uh, reading using phonics, but we'll, we'll have to do that another time, I think, um, and also you'll be able to find it on YouTube somewhere. But this little boy was unable to read six months prior to this video, and then you see him actually using phonics, which is sounding out the letters. So sounding out the, the sound of the letters to decode and to blend the words so that he can read them. So, well, it's been, it's been great talking to you, even though I haven't been <laughs> able to see you. But I think what I want you to take from this is that this is something that really, really should be celebrated. I have been so fortunate to have been involved in this right from the start. So 1999-2000, I knew as soon as I saw a video of kids in India that this is, this is where my heart was and this is what I wanted to do. Um, it's a success story. Millions 
uh, of poor children, children are actually getting a route out of poverty through the miracle of the market. These entrepreneurs have done it themselves. They've done it themselves without aid agencies and without governments, and that's what we've got to be very careful of now, that actually the markets aren't upset by people blundering in and actually um, upsetting what's going on. But parents have voted with their feet. They have voted away from the government school system that was failing them, and they've walked straight to the low-cost private schools. Well, I hope you've enjoy enjoyed that. I've enjoyed whizzing through. Um, obviously, if anybody wants to email me, it's pauline.dixon at ncl.ac.uk. Just look me up on Google. You should be able to find me there. Um, and also, we have our EG West website. So I'll probably leave that picture up there, and then I hopefully as long as you all haven't fallen asleep, I'll be able to hear Nick's voice and I'd love to take any questions. Thanks so much, Pauline. Uh, and we do have already, we already have a few questions um, and everyone is, all, is of course free to post additional ones. Um, so the first question is from Gloria. She asks, uh, have you seen a difference in the importance parents give to education in different countries? I ask you this because here in Guatemala, the impression is that low-cost private schools are a utopia, since poor parents here do not value education, they value children's labor more. Mm, that's in Guatemala. Well, I, I've, I've, I've only ever been to, I've been to Panama and I've been to Colombia. But in, uh, Gloria, in all of the places that I've actually been to, the illiterate parents in slums, um, value education so highly as do the children and in the developing countries and the slums that I've worked in the, the, the parents and the children they actually know that they're just going to get one chance at this and so they grab it with both hands there obviously will be some parents maybe they've got um, issues with alcohol or you know maybe they are very very poor and they Maybe they don't think about their children so much, but they are in the definite minority, tiny, tiny minority. The majority of, great majority of poor parents that I've come across really value education and they want, they want, they see that as a route out of poverty for their children, especially in somewhere like India, where these schools are English medium. That means that the children are learning English from age five and all of the curriculum is, is actually taught in English. And the parents believe that English will allow their children to get much better jobs than maybe learning the local language, which in Hyderabad, for example, is Telugu, or the language in India, which is Hindi or Urdu. Um, so, Gloria, maybe I should come to Guatemala and, and see for myself. But in the countries that I've worked in, parents give a massive uh, weighting to education for their children. Okay, next question from Carlo. Uh, many say that a system with private schools automatically lead to, leads to high fees that cannot be paid by a majority of the people. What is your experience and what do the studies show? And does competition prevent this process? So what was the first part of Carlo's question, Nick? First part was that um, many people believe that a system. Nick, I didn't hear that. Yeah, I didn't hear that. So it's something about. Sorry, that, sorry, say that again, Nick. Sorry. That private schools automatically lead to high fees. That, that this is a common misconception. Um, what is your experience, and how do, uh, is that being prevented? Um, well, the low-cost private schools that I've worked in. Um, generally keep their fees low because otherwise they wouldn't have a clientele. So no, they don't put their fees up. Um, if they open another school in a better area, so I've known school owners who maybe have two or three schools and they differentiate, differ, can't say it today, differentiate their fees according to the area in which they set up their school. But I've never witnessed the fact that they they, they put up their fees every year, but they might only put it up by five rupees or something. And they only put it up in an affordable way so that they actually maximize their number of students. It would be suicide for them, uh, for their profit motive and, and as an entrepreneur, if you are outpriced yourself in the market. And I think, um, Carlo, as opposed to a competition driving up the prices, if that's what I'm, maybe I've misconstrued that, actually competition keeps the prices low so that you'll find that there are competing, so many competing schools um, and they're competing for these parents who aren't very low wages. So obviously if the fees went up, they would lose 
they would lose their parents and they would lose their children. So uh, no, that hasn't been my experience. But there is a differentiated market, so there will be schools that charge lower fees and schools that charge middle income fees and so on. But typically, the unrecognised or the unregistered schools uh, charge lower fees than the recognised ones. Okay, next question from Imre. Um, I have read a lot of research about private education for the poor, but where can I find the latest info about your research and the research of other scholars? I think this is a question that could interest uh, a few people. So if it's okay with you, Pauline, you can send me uh, links or studies and I'll be able to send them on to everyone uh, in an email yeah. when the webinar is over. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thanks, Imran, for that. Um, obviously, I'll send links to Nick, but if you go onto Google and you find me at Newcastle, then all my research papers should be online there. Again, the EG West Centre, but I'll send some extra links uh, to Nick when we're finished. But thank you very much, Iman. It's, it's great to know that uh, students are interested in our work and other people's work because there are now other people obviously involved in looking at the sector. Michael Kramer, for example, Gita Kingdon. Um, there are some very big names now working in this area, so it's nice to have other people um, looking at low-cost private schools as well. Okay, we've got another question from Kai. Do you foresee the development of widespread standardized testing uh, as change of, uh, chains of schools expand? Kai, I think that's. I think a great idea is to change the tests. That the the government tests are really um, constricting the low-cost private schools because they obviously have to teach the class ten exams or the end of year exam exams. They have to teach the curriculum so the kids can get through that. And if the state exams are about filling in the gaps, then we're going to get that rote learning that we saw earlier. So I, I hopefully. If chains of low-cost private schools like Amiga and New Bridge materialize and more ch chains of private schools ma materialize, then maybe they can start setting their own exams or we can get outside bodies uh, setting exams such as uh, there's a, a company in India called NIT and they do their own exams and they do GNIT which would be a graduate of NIT. Um, so the exam systems really, really do need to change. How long that would take, Kai, I have no idea. But changing the government exam system uh, to a private one or to uh, get other people involved in the examination um, field is, I actually think is really, really important. And the question from Alerts: Are there problems with the recognition of the edu of the uh, education uh, of these schools in further or higher education? Um, I haven't done anything on. F is the question about further and higher education? I think the question is if these if these students um, uh, or these uh, these young people have received a private education. Um, does that allow them to go on to higher education or do they need a government uh, degree? I think that's that's the question. Okay, uh, Olex, I think that was your name. Um, that's a really good question. The um, children from low-cost private schools obviously do the state exams. If the school is unrecognized, that means that the um, children aren't able to take the state exam. So that's one reason that the school should be recognized. However, the school owners typically typically get round that and they send their children to another registered or recognized low-cost private school in order that they can take sit the exams. So the majority of children in private schools reach the end of their secondary education and they take the state exams. But then, yes, you're right, they then have the state exams and they've got the results and they then go on to plus two, which is like the sixth form in the UK, so that's standard 11 and 12. But typically, they're not private schools, that, that's going to be a, a government um, education system and then obviously the colleges and so on will also be government. But, but they're not restricted, no, as long as they get the exams at the end of uh, their, their private schools, then, then they can carry on. That's not a problem. Another question from Imre. How would parents know which schools are the best? 
Yeah, that's a good one, Imran. It's very, it's very difficult, isn't it? And I have asked school uh, parents this question, and they say that they, first of all, they see, especially in India, for example, they see how often their children speak English to each other, even though they, parents can't speak English. Um, so they listen to their the siblings or their friends and they see if they're speaking English or not. They look in their books and see how often they're marked. They, they ask the children what they've done each day. They make sure that the <coughs> teacher has been to school and they, the parents talk amongst themselves and uh, they typically compare schools within an area. So say there's five low-cost private schools within the walking distance of my house. Say, and, and typically in India, they're called St. John's Private School, Oxford Grammar School, very, very English-sounding names. The, the parents will know each of them, and they obviously rate their school highest because that's where they're sending their child, but they say they know the standard of the school uh, because of these measures that I've just spoken about. But also the school owner is um, very good at publicizing his own school results as well. So the class 10 exams, uh, they typically in India it's out of 600, and you'll see plastered all over the place, Oxford Grammar School topper, which is a top student, topper gains 559 points out of 600. So parents are knowing what those children are getting in those uh, end of school exams as well. So, and also that the, the um, school owners often send report cards home and so on. So it's, I think parents are basing it on the activity that is actually going on within the school and they're basing it on what the children tell them, speaking English and being able to communicate in English to one another, especially in India. And the question from Jan, why in your opinion do people have these prejudices that public schools are better than private ones? Is it because of the profit motive which people find immoral? Yes, Jan, it's really sad, isn't it? It's, I, I find it quite sad and I find it quite sad. It's the, the whole philosophical baggage thing that I, I think it's that children should be going to school for free. And I think it's the fact that children are paying and and for example, if you want to look up the work of Professor Keith Lewin, um, and he has lots to do with the Education for All monitoring report, he's very against low-cost private schools. Um, and I think it's the whole idea that it causes inequity, but so does state schooling. You know, that, that's not equitable either. Um, and it's also it's very sad that government schools have had a lot of government aid, they've had a lot of assistance, they get a lot of money from governments and so on, and they still perform so so badly in general, and there's a lot of teacher absenteeism. And I think one has to take note of the research findings, irrespective of what your one's gut instinct is. And I think you're um, actually absolutely right, Jan. I think it's the fact that people don't like the, the profit motive, that's that's one thing, and they don't think parents should have to pay. However, they're paying to go to um, government schools anyway, through the school uniforms, teacher uh, PTAs, parent teacher association fees, and so on. <clears throat> so there's very little in it. I think the quality in private schools needs to improve, and I think it can improve, and I think that's um, something that maybe aid agencies can help with, um, but uh, it would have to be thought through very carefully. And, and I think, you know, that something like the phonics can, can go a long way to helping children enjoy schooling a little bit more. Um, but I also think, um, Jan, that these experts, so-called, haven't been to see these schools. They haven't experienced them. They, they don't typically go into slum areas. They just um, maybe visit one school, and, and see that the government school seems to be working when they're there, but actually when they go, the toilets don't flush, the toilet doesn't work, the teachers aren't present, and they're only present on the day that the official guest arrives, whereas you actually need to be in the slum area for some time to actually absorb what's going on. But yes, it's this philosophical baggage, um, and, and uh, really people should drop that and, and think what's best for the kids. You know, what is best for these children? They're living now, they're, they're there now, and it's, it's really choice. I think it's down to choice, and the parents need to have that choice. And we don't need to force any choice onto those parents, it's it's up to them. But again, what is best for the kids needs to work. And it is working, it's working without any experts having a, an opinion anyway. But, you know, if we can help those kids, well, that's that's all of our aim, really. Okay, I'm going to take two more questions. Okay. 
Uh, the first one from Rico. Um, during your survey, have you seen many international teachers going into private schools or were they mostly local teachers? No, no, no. Oh, local teachers, all local teachers. I, so I saw no international teachers, none, none. Uh, if there was, there might have been one in Cabrera because they were from a charity or something, but no, no. Oh, Rico, they're all local. And the question from Paul, how much influence do you already get with your research results? It seems to me that most people don't even know about the existence of low-cost private schools in slums at all. Wow. <laughs> Our dissemination is failing. <laughs> um, well, Paul, uh, it's great if I've reached somebody today that didn't know about it. Um, it's actually had a major effect. Major. Um, as I say, governments are now aware of it. People who would have dismissed low-cost private schools before as being poor quality and they didn't really exist, such as the Department for International Development here, now know they exist. They know that they're doing a better job. Um, so, uh, and people like Pearsons have put money into helping uh, in, uh, evolve the low-cost chain in Amiga. Um, there's lots of microfinance companies that have now come into the sector to help. It's actually had a ha had a massive difference. It's taken 12 years so far, um, and the more people that know about it, the better. But obviously, Paul, uh, as uh, Rico said, I think it was Rico, um, people aren't necessarily going to agree with us, um, and they don't need to agree with us. That's that's fine, um, as long as we've got um, the ear of governments. So, uh, and another thing, Paul, I should have said was that um, in Nigeria they were going to close down. All the unrecognized schools in, in Makoko and our research actually saved those low-cost private schools, uh, the, the unregistered ones, because we showed they were actually outperforming the government schools. So we have saved schools being closed down. We have gone to the national governments and national governments are now very much aware that these low-cost private schools are particularly saving them money and are actually helping their children being educated. So I'm very proud to say that our research is actually having a, a very positive effect. Okay, I think I'm, I'm just going to allow for one more question that we got here um, from uh, Stanislav. How much does the state tax private schools and if the decrease of taxes can be, uh, can be a real help to downsize the fines for poor. I don't uh, really understand the the, the, the last uh, part of the question. No, um, I think I think Stanislav. I think they don't get taxed, but they can, they have to pay bribes. So it's more an issue of bribery than taxing. Uh, I I don't think the schools pay any tax at all uh, because they just hide their income. They um, you know they don't necessarily relay the exact amount of money that they're earning and typically in a developing country um, the government officials come to take bribes and that was what my PhD was all about was about the corruption and bribery um, during recognition process and I suppose it's a sort of a tax isn't it <laughs> bribery um, but the district education officer would come to the school um, if it's not recognized then they ask for a bribe in order to tick the boxes and the district education officers were very candid about that. They said, if I didn't take the bribe, somebody higher up would and it would cost the schools more. So I think it's more of a taxation through bribery and corruption than a proper taxation system. Okay, thank you. If I may just conclude with a question for myself. Um, with all your experience, has it <laughs> uh, made you look at our own educational system differently? Um, if you look at the European uh, educational systems um, that are to a large extent state-run. Uh, has your research allowed you to, to see what's going wrong there as well? Um, I mean, Nick, the only thing that I would say is that, um, I mean, Sweden's got a great system going on and um, I would say there's a great role for vouchers and also not to underestimate poor parents who actually do want their children to be educated and, and really that I think in Europe and in America we should have more choice and it's really allowing regulations to allow more private schools or low-cost private schools to actually set up um, so that's what I would say but but you know m my main focus is on the low-cost private schools but I think vouchers are a great thing and I think choice 
is really important to, to pe for, for, for parents and to improve the quality of education. We need innovation in schooling in Europe, especially in England. It's as though children are being educated again 100 years ago. It's not a lot has improved and that's because there's not a lot of competition and there's not a lot of innovation, um, just like Milton Friedman uh, would have said about education really. So yeah, it's, but let's not finish on a down note. <laughs> let's finish on a good note and you know just think about all the good things that are happening for these kids in in the developing world okay thanks very much pauline it was a very interesting talk uh, and the questions were really good as well so i'd like to, to thank everyone else uh who sent in uh sent in a question i would like to conclude um with a few uh with a few remarks um first of all uh i'm of course obliged to um to promote our ESFLC, the European Students for Liberty Conference, which is coming up in March next year. Um, registration is, of course, still possible at only 30 euros for students and 45 for non-students. You get all your meals covered, uh, your attendance, uh, free books and other free stuff that you can take home with you. So we encourage you to uh, look at our webpage, uh, studentsforliberty.org, and you can click on uh, European Students for Liberty Conference and you, you will find all the information there. We hope to see you there in March. Uh, in two weeks we will have our last ESFL webinar of this, uh, of this series and it will feature Johan Norberg who will be talking on defending capitalism in today's climate. Um, so I hope to hear you there uh, as well. And to finish on a, on a good note, on a positive note, um, I think these webinars provide a small, uh, a small sample of private education. Uh, we try to do our best. Um, so let me conclude by thanking you all for, uh, for attending, thanking Pauline and paraphrasing Mark Twain, uh, who said, don't let your schooling interfere with your education. Exactly so, right, Nick. Thank you very much, everybody. It's been a pleasure. Good night, everyone.